Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the, uh, the session here on, um, on enriching human health and nutrition. Uh, my name is Scott Rankin. I'm a professor in the food science department and I currently serve as chair. Uh, I also serve uh, with my co-host here, Kent Weigel, um, from Animal Dairy and Science on the Madison uh, Dairy Innovation Hub Madison Steering Committee. And that committee kind of oversees and stewards the resources made available to the Dairy Innovation Hub at the Madison campus. Um, we also serve on the advisory committee and that has a maybe more global view of the Dairy Innovation Hub across the Wisconsin uh, investments and, and energies as such. Let's see, um, we have a handful of housekeeping items. Essentially the flow of the program will be, uh, uh, Kent and I will sort of trade off um, introducing the speakers. And uh, we'll go through each speaker's presentation, which is about 25 to 30 minutes. At the end, when we're all done, we'll have about 30 minutes for questions and answers then. So I'd ask that you hold your questions for that time. Uh, if um, you do have a question, I invite you to use the microphone, uh, to come to the microphone. Everything's being recorded and of course broadcast to the online component of today's program. Let's see, if you are online and do have a question, uh, Kara Lutke in the back is, um, is uh, uh, surveilling questions posed through the online system. Uh, we'd ask that if you do have a question to start your query with a Q colon and then fill in your question and Carl will look for that as an as a indication there's an online question. I think that's about it. Our first speaker then is uh, Yu Hasegawa. She is a postdoctoral research in the, Brad of, in, the Brad, in the lab rather of Brad Bowling, who's a professor in our department. Their lab's work looks at the fine chemistry of food, including those chemistries that influence uh, human health and, and, this, and in particular, the influence of uh, food components on chronic inf inflammatory diseases. Uh, Yu has her um, PhD from UC Davis and again is here uh, working with Brad as a postdoctoral researcher as funded by the Dairy Innovation Hub. So join me in welcoming Yu Hasegawa. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Yu. Um, I am really happy to present here at the Dairy Symposium. And I, today I'd like to present some of our studies that, oh, sorry, um, studies the yogurt, the function of yogurt, uh, especially to attenuate inflammation. But when we talk about inflammation, it can come from multiple uh, route. So I'd like to uh, especially focus on the one that observed in the obese population. <laughs> sorry, there you go. Um, so let me start uh, with a little bit of a background. So overweight and obesity are defined as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that may impair health. And then the prevalence is increasing around the world. And, but uh, here in the US, it's around 40%, 42%, which means at least one in three adults are struggling with obesity. And then what's important about obesity is that it can lead to a number of health complications such as cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases. So there are a lot to talk about obesity, but um, as I said, I'd like to focus on inflammation. That is the uh, key to study those um, health complications associated with obesity. And um, inflammation is necessary for immunity, but excessive and chronic inflammation can cause tissue injury, leading to um, those health complications. So um, rather than solely relying on um, uh, medicines to deal with those health complications, it would be nice if we can introduce health promoting food like dairy um, products to our diet and, um, and, and uh, tackle th those problems. So in our lab, we especially st uh, focus on yogurt and to um, especially the function to attenuate the inflammation. So let me introduce some of our previous and also ongoing studies on yogurt. And then the first one was done by our group a couple years ago where we um, um, provided either no fat dairy yogurt or um, no dairy soy pudding to premenopausal and obese women before providing them a challenge meal which was high in fat and carbohydrate so that it can uh, induce postprandial inflammation. And here's the result. And this is a marker for um, barrier dysfunction, but you can see that in this control group, 
it elevates soon after the consumption of the, the challenge meal, and then they experience elevated level of inflammation as shown in this uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine, IL-6. On the other hand, when they consumed yogurt, they showed um, reduction in both markers. So then our question, next question was how? So what's the mechanism behind this? So um, here is a, a little bit of introduction of what's going on in our gut. Um, so here we have epithelial cells, and in order for us to have a proper um, barrier uh, function, um, we need uh, those proteins to function uh, properly. And those are called tight junction proteins, such as ZO1, ovulin, and cloudin. Um, but when the um, inflammation, like uh, inflammatory cytokines or other factors are present, um, these protein function gets disrupted so that um, harmful molecules or bacteria can invade into the blood and cause inflammation. And we can actually mimic this condition by adding the inflammatory um, cytokines artificially to the culture cells. So that's what we did in this study. Um, so the researchers added an inflammatory cactyl, which is a combination of those um, inflammatory cytokines and then molecule to the epithelial cell uh, culture cells. And then that significantly reduced the expression of one of the tight junction protein, ocudin. And that led to, um, this is the marker of uh, uh, intestinal barrier uh, integrity, but that led to a significant reduction um, compared to the cells that just received the media. Um, on the other hand, when we added the yogurt to, uh, in, in the, to the system, that not only prevented the reduction caused by the inflammation, but actually elevated the uh, expression of a tight junction protein, and also um, prevented the reduction we found in the, uh, caused by the inflammatory cactyl. So then next our question was, what in the yogurt actually provided such health promoting or protective effect? Um, so we hypothesized that this pathway called HR, that is the abbreviation of a, you can kind of, you can't really see, but a real hydrocarbon receptor pathway, uh, may be the key to answer that question. So HR is a transcription factor that regulates a gene that's involved in immunity and also maintaining the um, healthy barrier function. So here's a little bit about how it's involved in the, um, this barrier function. So when um, their dietary lipids or chemicals are present in the system, that disrupt the function of tight junction, leading to elevated permeability, and that therefore um, that leads to elevated level of a pro inflammatory environment. But when the researchers added a HR agonist to elevate HR activity in epithelial cells, that led to restored activity of tight junction protein, leading to attenuated um, level of a permeability and the um, pro inflammatory environment. And here is what we uh, hypothesized that the how yogurt may be involved in this pathway. Um, as I said, HR is a transcription factor that regulates um, the downstream gene to maintain a healthy barrier function, but this guy needs to get activated by its ligands to bind. So who are or what are those ligands? They are tryptophan metabolites. So we can either consume tryptophan metabolites from the diet or the proteins in the diet can be uh, digested throughout the GI tract, and then the majority of the uh, tryptophan is transported to the liver and converted into one of the HR ligands, or a small portion of it can flow into the intestine where um, gut microbes there can convert it into a variety of um, HR ligands. So we hypothesized that Yogurt fermentation actually elevates the tryptophan metabolites from its original milk, and therefore we observed a uh, protective effect in the gut. So in this uh, DIH-funded project, we firstly wanted to um, profile how yogurt fermentation alters the milk protein or a tryptophan, uh, sorry, milk protein to tryptophan metabolites, aka HR ligands. And also we wanted to confirm that the, those yogurt that we produce actually provides the protective effect against the uh, um, induced inflammation in a culture cell model. Um, so we made a regular yogurt by fermenting pasteurized milk using a commercially available yogurt culture, and that's, uh, we label it as YCX11. 
But we also wanted to explore a way to even improve that protective effect. So we did a couple more. Uh, we, we made a couple more uh, different kinds of yogurt. And one of it is to uh, fortify the milk with whey protein concentrate because um, that is rich in protein and tryptophan so that we were expecting to see elevation in the um, tryptophan metabolites in the yogurt. We also tested uh, either of these two um, probiotic strains that we know uh, metabolize tryptophan. So those are either Lactobacillus, uh, Rhamnosus GG, LGG, or the Rotary RTLC. Um, and if we firstly um, um, profiled the tryptophan metabolites using the mass spec, and then um, confirm their biological impact. So here I'm showing the um, relative abundance of tryptophan metabolites. We profiled seven of them, but um, four out of seven showed elevation in the tryptophan metabolites, and those are listed here. But especially the tryptamin and the indole 3 lactic acid were not detected in milk and only uh, present in the regular yogurt. So those are uniquely produced by the yogurt fermentation. But uh, unfortunately, the whey protein fortification and the probiotics uh, supplementation did not lead to significant elevation in the HR ligands that we profiled compared to the regular yogurt. So that was not something that we expected, but that's the result. And next, we wanted to um, confirm that they actually provide the health uh, protective effect. So I seeded a, a human epithelial cells, uh, culture cells, CACO2 cells, and the trans wall, and then measured the electric resistance between the epical and the basal compartment to um, assess that the membrane integrity. So when I induced information um, in, in, the, in the system, the membrane um, integrity gets disrupted so that this value, TER, uh, is going to uh, drop. So here, I'm showing the TER value over the course of time after I added I induced the inflammation. And this black line is where I added an inflammatory capital to the model. So you can see that that dropped soon after addition of or induction of the inflammation. Whereas um, supplementation of yogurt sample of any kind um, improved the reduction found in the inflammatory capital or group. So, um, and then, but as you can see, there is no significant group difference between the, the different kinds of yogurt that we produce. So too bad, but the regular yogurt was good enough to um, provide the health or protective effect. Um, but at future experiments, uh, I am planning to run on targeted metabolomics analysis to really understand the, the metabolic profile of those yogurt samples. And also importantly, uh, we need to definitely run HR activation assay to see whether and how much those yogurt samples can actually elevate HR in a cell reporter um, assay. So um, during the last part of my presentation, I would like to present other ongoing studies. And one of it is to, um, to study the how yogurt attenuates inflammation um, via a tissue-mediated mechanism. So we use mouse model so that uh, we can use the invasive method and really see what's going on in the tissue. So um, in this study, we induce obesity by providing a high fat diet to both female and male mice for 11 weeks. And after that, um, all the mice, including lean and, and both of them, uh, were fed Western diet. But half of uh, both lean and obese group, obese mice, were supplemented with yogurt powder. So lean mice that was fed regular Western diet was labeled as CC group, and then those uh, supplemented with yogurt was labeled as CY. And the same for the fat obese mice, it's either FC or FY groups. And we collected a whole bunch of tissues, but the, due to the time restriction, I'd like to uh, talk uh, a few of our main findings today. Um, and then the first piece of uh, results that caught our attention was this um, insulin resistance marker called HOMA-IR. And uh, we found that, that there's no significant group difference in the female mice, although these obese mice showed a relatively higher level of HOMA-IR, uh, whereas in male, the obese mice showed significant elevation in the HOMA-IR level. But uh, interestingly, addition of yogurt powder to the diet reduced the level of HOMA-IR significantly. 
So we wanted to know why, what's the mechanism. And so here's what we know from the previous publications. Um, in uh, obese people and animals, we know that the gut microbes uh, tended to be um, changed in a way that elevates the intestinal permeability. And that is associated with a low-grade but systemic level of a lipopolysaccharide, LPS, in the blood, which is um, accompanied by the uh, um, increased generation of LBP, that's LPS binding protein. And LBS and LBP makes a complex and binds to CD14, which induces the downstream pro-inflammatory signals. And then that um, blocks the insulin action in the adipocyte or damage the other tissues like uh, muscles and the liver to induce insulin resistance. Then let's look at what we found in our study. So here I am showing the beta diversity or the uh, microbial profile or composition of a sequel content of a mice. And we found there is no group difference in a female mice, whereas in male mice, we found that the yogurt supplementation uniquely changed the uh, sequel microbiota, but only in the obese mice, not in the lean one. Um, and then uh, here's the plasma LBP level, but this time we found that both female and male obese mice showed significant elevation in the LBP compared to the uh, originally lean mice, but the yogurt powder supplementation significantly attenuated the level of LBP in the plasma. Um, so yogurt was able to alter the gut microbes, microbiota in the way that may attenuate the intestinal permeability. I said may because in this study we actually didn't uh, directly measure the permeability, but from the previous our studies and also other publications, it's been uh, repeatedly shown, so that I put this icon here. Um, and uh, yogurt uh, supplementation in our study um, attenuated the generation of LBP um, and found in the plasma. So that eventually led to the attenuated level of insulin resistance. But as you may have realized, we don't know this middle part, so that's something that I'm uh, actively uh, trying to, um, um, to study right now. And the other ongoing study is a human intervention study. Um, so in this study, we tried to understand how yogurt attenuates inflammation, but from the aspect of uh, immune cells. And we just started um, sample collection last week, so um, we hope that we can uh, report something exciting in the future. Um, in conclusion, um, yogurt fermentation was able to elevate not all, but the specific HR ligands, and that, um, so, it, so that the yogurt may activate HR pathway, and that may be the, um, the uh, mechanism to attenuate the intestinal uh, barrier dysfunction, uh, disruption dis <laughs> uh, caused by inflammation. And then also, yogurt supplementation was able to attenuate insulin resistance in a diet-induced mouse obese model. Um, and then this was uh, done potentially by uh, altering the gut microbiota and therefore uh, attenuating the um, intestinal permeability and inflammation. Um, lastly but not least, we uh, appreciate all the support from the Dairy Innovation Hub and National Dairy Council. And then some of our studies, um, that the studies that I presented today were started by our previous postdocs, Rison and uh, Ruma. And I really, really appreciate all the support and guidance from our, uh, my PI, Dr. Bowling. And thank you for our lab members. I do like uh, working with you guys. So uh, with that being said, thank you very much for your attention. And I'd love to answer any questions that you may have later. All right, I'm repositioned. Sorry, online folks. Um, so I'm Kent Weigel. I'm a chair of the Animal and Dairy Sciences Department. I'm a dairy cattle geneticist here at UW Madison, also on the Madison Steering Committee and the Advisory Council. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. So Thomas Zolper is an associate professor of mechanical engineering at UW Platteville. 
I think I was selected to introduce him because I'm a UW Platteville grad and my son's a mechanical engineer, so apparently qualified for this introduction. And he specializes in fluid dynamics, uh, energy systems, and uh, polymer rheology. And so along with the colleagues and students, Tom is working to develop tools to predict mouth taste sensations for ice cream as part of a faculty fellowship that's funded by the Dairy Hub. So please welcome Tom Zolberg. Nice to be introduced by an alumni. Well, hello everyone. I uh, may take a moment to get accustomed to the uh, controller. Okay, so, yeah, my name is Thomas Alper. I've been doing mechanical engineering for the past 12, 15 years or so. I did my dissertation research on polymer rheology at Northwestern University and learned a lot about the rheology of inorganic materials, uh, but when we took on organic materials, especially perhaps the most complex dairy product, that is to say ice cream, it opened the door to a lot of additional challenges. So I've been working with uh, a student, Victoria Chanez, in environmental engineering, a colleague, Bedan Roy, in mechanical engineering, and then Tara Montgomery, whom I'm sure some of you know as well. And we've been trying to understand better how it is that the ingredients in a complex dairy product, as I said, ice cream is probably among the most complex we could choose, how the ingredients affect rheological properties, which can, for the most part, be measured using dedicated instruments, and how they manifest in customer satisfaction through use of sensory studies or so-called organoleptic properties. So I kind of tried to use a, a shorthand nomenclature, you could say. Uh, the re ingredients listed I, I denote with the variable X, independent variable, and then the rheological properties, the dependent variable Y, and also the sensory characteristics, the dependent variable Z. These are actually matrices that we're eventually going to be applying analysis of variance to to extricate how it is that ingredients affect properties and sensory characteristics and eventually we intend to uh, develop uh, correlations between these two dependent variables, Y and Z, shown there. So we started off with just uh, outlining the basic ingredients for ice cream, and we went with six ingredients, four of which we varied, and the other of two we kept constant. The, the two that were constant were salt and vanilla content, but we varied the dairy content, a uh, mixture of heavy whipping cream and whole milk, sugar content and then starch content and uh, basically did experiments to see how those manifest in rheological properties as well as uh, organoleptic or that is to say sensory characteristics. And then to assess the contributions of individual essentially molecules contained within the ingredients, we initially designed a set of experiments using a statistical process developed by George Box, who incidentally is the founder of the statistics department at UW-Madison. And then we applied a second technique referred to as analysis of variance. Uh, these are commonly used in engineering practice to tune machines. Something complex like a jet engine or a carburetor can have several different variables like airflow, fuel flow, uh, angular velocity, combustion temperature, and all of those things, but they lend themselves very well to use in other applications, and in this case we found that they were very well suited for assessing or elucidating how it is that the ingredients affect the, um, again, rheological and sensory characteristics of dairy products. So as I mentioned, um, ice cream is typically comprised of a few main ingredients, as you might imagine, the dairy product, cream. Um, it's which is an extract of, I guess, milk in general. So we can vary the cream content anywhere from more or less skim characteristics all the way up to heavy whipping cream. Then we've got sweeteners, which are usually some type of sugar, corn, cane, beet, or um, synthetic sugar, or I mean um, sugar substitutes, I should say. Then we've got emulsifiers, eggs, cornstarch. We went with cornstarch because we didn't want to have to deal with a pasteurization process, which kind of would have uh, lengthened the time it took to manufacture the products. Stabilizers we didn't include in this case, and then for flavorings we just went with vanilla ice cream with a very consistent level of vanilla in, in the ice cream sample. Now ice cream itself is a complex three-phase viscoelastic material, so it's got a combination of uh, solid fat globules and ice crystals. 
liquid serum comprised of proteins and dissolved sweeteners and flavorings and all of that, and then air bubbles, so solid liquid gas, uh, all contained in that mixture. And had I known at the beginning that it would be so complex to kind of extricate all the contributions of those materials, I might not have taken it on, but uh, it did turn out to be a really good challenge. And the actual uh, rheological properties that affect customer satisfaction are affected by a variety of the manufacturing processes used as well. The air entrainment, for those of you who aren't aware, ice cream is about 50% air. There's this stirring process that uh, basically churns air into the ice cream, I guess, solution, and simultaneously freezes it and creates the little ice crystals contained within. So, Essentially, one of the important parts of manufacturing ice cream is quickly freezing it so you have small ice, cre ice crystals and small air bubbles, and that enhances the smoothness and all those, those things that play into customer satisfaction. So size and distribution of air, ice, and fat, ideally all around 50 microns or less, creates the most smooth texture, whereas if you have larger ice crystals at least, there's a noticeably coarse texture to the ice cream as well. And then there's a aging process that also uh, enhances the cross-linking of various biopolymers contained within the liquid serum as well. And that we didn't involve directly. We tried to make a, a fairly consistent, short, relatively short manufacturing process facilitated by Dr. Montgomery in her animal science class. Now, there's a lot of things going on in the mixture itself. As I mentioned, I had studied the rheology of inorganic polymers, and typically we only work with a mixture of two or three ingredients. But in this case, we had all sorts of organic materials, polymers and not, including lipids, cholesterol, carbohydrates, protein, sugars, fibers, and all of those things. And we can't directly um, characterize their interactions, at least at the um, microscopic level, at the moment, but we can treat it as a black box, so to speak, and input variations in ingredients and get an output of rheological properties and um, sensory characteristics. And of course, we want to optimize the sensory characteristics because if you're not pleasing the humans that eat ice cream, there's really no point in trying to optimize it. So just to give you a little overview of kind of the complexity of manufacturing ice cream, uh, you start off with just selecting your ingredients and mixing them, uh, typically under a little heat and some uniform stirring. Then uh, the pasteurization process, at least if it's unpasteurized milk or if there's eggs or any other products that have to be uh, pasteurized is, is part of the um, industrial process for manufacturing. Likewise, homo homo homogenization, typically done at around 71 Celsius and 13, 14 megapascals of pressure to give a very uniform consistency to the material. Then we've got refrigeration and maturation. Uh, in this case, typically they store at around four or five Celsius overnight, and this facilitates the cross-linkings of the biopolymers in the solution. We actually bypassed this process because we were doing it under some time constraints and, and had to get through it at a, in a reasonably short time. Then the whipping and freezing process, usually there's dedicated machinery for that, and we've got uh, equipment that does that. Typically 20, 25 minutes of air entrainment while simultaneously freezing it produces the ideal texture of the mixture, at least if the ingredients are in the right uh, combinations. Afterwards, at least for industrial processes, there's a packing and then hardening process where they can basically store it. If it's held below negative 25 Celsius, it can be stored more or less indefinitely. But if it's at a higher temperature, it will end up stratifying and um, decreasing the, the quality, so to speak, of the ice cream. So we started with a baseline recipe developed by Dr. Montgomery in Animal Science 3010, and she had about 28, 30 students or so working together in their laboratory to synthesize these materials. In this case, I have my students at least call it a three-phase viscoelastic material to impress uh, interviewers when they're on the job search. Uh, but we use, uh, her recipe used two cups heavy whipping cream, a cup and a half of whole milk, two cups sugar, one, two tablespoons of pudding mix, which we actually substituted with one tablespoon of cornstarch, and then a half tablespoon of salt, teaspoon of, uh, or teaspoons of salt and vanilla. We tripled the size of this for a variety of reasons. On the one hand, we have 
organoleptic studies that we wanted to take, and we wanted to make sure we had a statistically representative sample. So we were able to get about 28 students, and we trained them quite thoroughly on uh, ice cream assessment, uh, the details of which I'll kind of present a little bit later. And then we also needed enough samples to perform the rheological measurements on our dedicated uh, rheometer. Sorry, my mask is a little undersized. So we tripled the size of the recipe that uh, we calculated would be sufficient to provide you know, reasonable samples to the 30 so students who would be testing it, as well as ample samples for us to cut little um, pieces and put into our rheometer. And as I mentioned, we used a design of experiment approach that's a statistical process used to tune and optimize machinery. And in this case, we had our six ingredients. So that X matrix I showed on the earlier so slide is populated with X1, heavy cream, X2, whole milk, uh, X3, sugar, uh, four, cornstarch, and vanilla. And the um, items in parentheses, at least six cups of uh, heavy cream, six cups whole milk, are the baseline recipe. And then the variation of parameters basically says we'd either increase cream content in the recipe by two cups, or increase whole milk, or in the case of sugar and cornstarch, you can see we just added a cup or tablespoon in those cases. Uh, and then so we used variation of parameters, a, just a design of experiments a method, to apply to the four variables, the ingredients that we would actually vary, and then we kept the other two ingredients constant. And these themselves led to some interesting uh, results, at least in the sensory studies, as, as you'll see in some forthcoming slides. But in ap applying the design of experiments technique, we'd have had two to the fourth power, that is to say 16 different recipes that we'd have to work with, and that was a little too ambitious for the time frame we were working on, so we set a constraint, that is that the dairy products, the sum of the dairy products would be 12 cups, and uh, this essentially allowed us to treat these X1 and X2 as a single variable, XD, which denotes dairy, uh, and thereby kind of cut our experimental, I guess, uh, sample preparation time in half, as well as much of the analysis as well. So, uh, as I said, design of experiments was used, a uh, method developed by George Box, and essentially what we have there is the purple uh, circle represents a baseline recipe, and that's located at the center of a kind of uh, cube, where it, on the three axes of the cube, on that uh, horizontal axis, we've got the cornstarch content, uh, the low levels are on the left, high levels are on the right. Likewise, on the vertical axis, we've got sugar content, so two cups of sugar versus four cups of sugar, or I should say one cup of sugar versus three cups of sugar. And then depth into the board uh, is the cream content, where toward me is low cream content, that is to say predominantly whole milk, and then further away from me is predominantly cream. And just to kind of give you a sense of uh, what you'll be seeing a little bit later, you see the lower left corner I've labeled negative one, negative one, negative one. That essentially means low cream, low sugar, low starch. And on the upper right corner, I've got positive one, positive one, positive one, high cream, high sugar, high starch. Just kind of a shorthand notation to allow you to read the plots a little more quickly. And it happened that they um, played out in pretty um, convenient way, I guess you could say, for how it is that the uh, three ingredients influence them. But just to give you a sense of how cream content affected the samples, low cream, con meant, cream content meant there was a greater proportion of water in the mixture, and so the ice cream samples tasted a little bit icy, or they had the, a bit of a coarse texture due to the uh, ice crystals that occurred in greater abundance. And likewise, high cream content created samples that had a little bit of a, a buttery texture to them. As, as you're aware, butter is made of heavy whipping or heavy cream. And so uh, there were palpable differences that the sensors had uh, detected in them. And we, as I mentioned, are, are trying to bridge the sensory characteristics of the ice cream to the rheological properties and essentially develop an optimization algorithm to really tune in on what I guess is representative of customer satisfaction in ice cream 
products, but this can be broadly adapted really to any dairy product or frankly any food product as, as the approach is quite robust. So uh, this is a table then of the recipes that we ended up producing. Uh, here we've got the baseline recipe, 000, uh, one that had been found over years of um, teaching and research to produce a reliable sample. Then we've got the low cream, low sugar, low starch, and high cream, high sugar, high starch samples there. All the rest are just kind of variants of um, like high starch here, high starch there, uh, high sugar plus one, and high sugar plus one there. So you would intuit it, or you would intuit there would be differences in the sweetness and the thickness of these samples. Um, and so moving then on to the performance, we'll look into what we uh, overviewed as uh, rheological properties and so-called organoleptic or sensory properties, which again I labeled with the um, variables uh, Y and Z there, which represent a matrix of a dozen or more of those properties that we were ultimately assessing in both instances. So one instrument that we needed to perform this research was a rheometer. So we contacted Anton Parr, purchased this modular compact rheometer, which has all sorts of um, functionality to it. On the one hand, it uses the, uh, that uh, movable head uh, on the top right there, which has uh, variable probes that can be put into place that can measure the angular velocity, the angular torque or shear stress. It can oscillate, it can rotate, it can you know, characterize all those rates. It's got load cells that allow it to um, measure the normal load, that is to say the compressive or tensile loads that are applied by the machine. And then it's got a range of different modules that can fit in the bottom there, and actually the tools on top are also interchangeable as well. And it, uh, interestingly enough, has the sensitivity of uh, torque sensitivity, I should say, at least of 0.1 nanonewton meters, which is equivalent to the torque that your shoulder would feel if a snowflake landed on your hand. So the torque of a snowflake at arm's length, which I don't think we can actually detect. I mean, you can feel the cold from the snowflake and you might feel its actual impact on your hand, but humans, as far as I can tell, are unable to detect that. And so it's got air bearings, it's got uh, really refined temperature control, actually a double form of temperature control. So we were able to control the sample of our temperatures, our, our our, the temperature of our samples within a very high level. And we had to make use of two modules for this device. On the one hand, there's a fairly standard configuration referred to as a couette setup, or sometimes just called a concentric cylinder. This would be a cross section of a bob on the inside of a cup and there's very precise radial distances uh, between uh, of the bob on the inside and then the cup on the outside giving us a very precise gap from which we can calculate the shear stresses the shear strains strain rates and all of those things and we can set angular velocity we can set torque we can set all of those measurements there and then the second configuration we used is a so-called parallel plate arrangement. And this is, as the name sounds, just an upper plate and a lower plate, where again, we can apply a normal load up and down. We can apply an oscillatory mode that is um, movement back and forth, or we can apply full rotational uh, mode. And in all of these cases, uh, or for that configuration, that's what the majority of our experiments used. And so, just to give you an overview of kind of the data output by the rheometer itself, we used the uh, cup and bob or couette uh, viscometer assembly for a series of shear stress versus shear strain rate measurements. And these give us indications of the viscosity, the smoothness, you know, several characteristics of the, the sample. And then we've got uh, temperature sweep that was done with the uh, parallel plate arrangement. We did frequency sweep, strain sweep, and then penetration and compliance measurements. This penetration study, as I'll show in a forthcoming slide, is actually representative of a mouth chewing a sample, so it's applicable pretty much for foods across the board. But this is some of the results that we've produced thus far. We've got our uh, visco viscometry measurements, in this case, shear stress versus uh, shear strain rate. And you can see the higher cream samples have a higher creaminess or higher viscosity overall. We also did a uh, 
storage and loss modulus assessment. And in this case, it's done as a function of temperature. So you can see going from negative 20 to positive 10 Celsius, it undergoes a phase change uh, from a more or less solid material when it's frozen to a more or less liquid material. And believe it or not, customer satisfaction is based on the rate at which a phase change occurs in ice cream. And several of the insights we gain from this are uh, the scoopability of the ice cream, the sensorial impression of coldness. You don't want it to be like an ice cube that just takes forever to melt, but you don't want it to be like cotton candy that melts too quickly. And then several other properties or characteristics can be deduced from that correlation as well. Likewise, the storage modulus, um, in this case, storage and loss modulus correspond to solid and liquid characteristics respectively. And so this uh, research here, we're still kind of beginning our measurements in that area, but uh, this corresponds to the ice crystal size and it's one company's effort to promote their uh, rapid freezing process referred to as alt ice. Other characteristics we measured were the um, strain behavior. So um, strain rate is a or shear moduli as a function of strain rate. And then this one here is actually using the parallel plate assembly, applying a normal load first in compression. So the positive um, data right there refers to, or is in representative of a person biting down or squeezing a material between their tongue and palate. The negative data right there is opening the mouth again. And if it's a sticky material, um, you know, like, I don't know, um, peanut brittle, uh, it may hold together. And it, it gives us a lot of insights into the food's behavior themselves, such as the brittleness of the material, the hardness of the material. We've got adhesiveness, cohesiveness, elasticity, and several other properties that can be measured from that. And then the creep compliance measurement requires the use of, uh, or at least is modeled through use of spring damper systems, where all of those E's denote so-called Young's modulus or elasticity of the material and the reciprocal is the uh, compliance of the material. And then the dampers on the right are actually representative of the viscous characteristics. So all of those Greek letter A does represent the viscosity contributions of different components of the ice cream mix. So the stabilizer gel, the ice crystals, uh, fat crystals and all of that stuff. And that's a uh, challenging experiment. There are uh, uh, calculations that I had some of my students take on. Finally, moving on to uh, sensory characteristics, we did a very detailed uh, literature review of organoleptic studies of ice cream occurring from the 1920s. I think we found some files from the uh, Wisconsin State Fair on people submitting ice cream samples. A, and uh, the literature review really went up to the present time. Ultimately, we were able to um, create a sensor survey that divided the characteristics into body, texture, um, melt rate and uh, flavor characteristics. Uh, the body characteristics are representative of what you sense when you eat a spoonful of ice cream, so kind of a bulk representation. Texture characteristics are char uh, what you sense when the ice cream is between your tongue and palate, so it's like more of a thin film layer. And then melt characteristics probably makes sense uh, intuitively to you. And finally, flavor, these are the ones we can't actually test with machinery, but we were able to use human sensory studies for those. So we gave uh, nine different samples of ice cream to about 28 students and then collected their responses to them. This was after a few days of training and just overview and preparation for it. So they were pretty well trained sensors. And ultimately what we see here is the high cream, high sugar, high starch sample in the gray triangles, the baseline sample in the white boxes, and then the low cream, low sugar, low starch samples in the blue area. And I use blue because it's kind of the color of ice, maybe um, to, to make that connection for later on. But these then are uh, their assessments, and you can see the standard deviations of the samples were quite variable. Some students thought they were too cohesive, others thought insufficiently cohesive. Likewise, gummy, moisture, and all of those characteristics. Texture characteristics, we had viscous, smooth, aerated, coating, creamy. And just fortuitously, it happened that most of the data uh, went from low to high essentially. So low cream, low sugar, low starch on the blue line to high cream, high sugar, high starch on the, um, on the gray line. 
And this in its own right was a, a robust um, research activity that uh, may garner a paper of its own. But then uh, the last results, we just kind of combined the meltdown characteristics with the flavor characteristics and kind of got some uh, mixed data there. And one of the interesting results that arose from this was we held the salt and vanilla levels constant in all experiments. And you can see, at least on the one hand, the salt characteristics were assessed virtually identical for all, by all 30 students over that time, whereas the impression of vanilla flavor varied quite substantially. And it was driven by some confounding factors created by the cream, the sugar, and the uh, starch content. Uh, butteriness was another factor, but I'll just kind of buzz by that. So a lot of results were fairly intuitive. Sweet corresponded to sugar, creamy corresponded to cream content. Um, so there were a lot of fairly direct correlations, but then a few inverse correlations that were quite counterintuitive. And these were kind of what we wanted to really extricate in the first place. And uh, as I mentioned, we were doing rheological measurements in order to correlate them to sensory characteristics. And this one test, the sensory, I mean the uh, penetration test, gives us a lot of direct connections to the body characteristics of the ice cream, that is to say of a bulk sample itself. And uh, we're in the process of kind of um, processing and analyzing the data. We're just finishing the experiments now. And um, you know, upon deducing the correlations, we'll then proceed with um, um, reporting the results, maybe next spring. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tom. We appreciate your uh, com complex view of, of ice cream. Well, between yogurt and ice cream, the future looks very positive for, for dairy. All right, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Chuan Hoon, who is an assistant professor in our department. We're blessed to have her join us a few years ago. Chuan uh, comes um, to us um, doing a PhD at uh, UC Davis and postdoctoral work at uh, University of Washington. She's published some landmark studies on cyclic um, di AMP and has turned her attention in part to um, the role of or the, the, looking at uh, listeria monocytogenes as a concern uh, in the dairy foods uh, and dairy realm in general. So please join with me in, uh, in welcoming Tuan. Tuan. All right, thank you, Scott, for the introduction. Um, like Scott mentioned, my lab uh, studies all things Listeria, and when I came here, the only thing I was concerned about was Listeria pathogenesis and molecular mechanism. So I must give a big shout out to the Dairy Hub for opening my eyes and educating me to start thinking about dairy and the intersection of food safety and animal health, which I'm going to tell you about today. Okay, so um, if you haven't heard about it, Listeria monocytogenes is a prominent foodborne pathogen in humans. Um, in the U.S. alone, the CDC estimates about 1,600 cases of listeriosis per year. And in all, honestly, that's not a huge number, but what's really concerning about listeriosis is that it can be severe and can be lethal for certain people. And that's because listeria, even though it's a foodborne pathogen, it doesn't like to stay in the gut. And it actually likes to get out of the gut and go into the bloodstream and infect multiple organs in the body. Um, and healthy people can mostly clear listeria pretty well, but immunocompromised people may have severe illness with mortality rates of up to 30%. And of course, for pregnant women, listeria can infect the fetus, uh, causing late-term abortion and stillborn, and that's devastating. Um, listeria is quite a versatile foodborne pathogen in that it can grow in different kinds of foods. And dairy products are particularly prone to listeria contamination, and I'm going to tell you more about it in just a little bit. So listeria is not just bad news for humans. It's also a common uh, pathogen among agricultural animals. And uh, for instance, it can infect more than 40 animal species, including goats, sheep, which are quite susceptible. Uh, cattle are another major reservoir for listeria. Um, most adult cattle would look fine, uh, but occasionally some of them may succumb to severe illness. 
Um, and uh, their uh, clinical symptoms would include uh, encephalitis, abortion, uh, septicemia, and in these cases, they're really hard to treat, and unfortunately, most of them will be gone or come back with uh, uh, permanent brain damage. And finally, of course, uh, animal infection with listeria carries a huge risk of zoonotic infection to dairy farm workers and to our uh, food production chain. Okay, so there are many challenges of controlling listeria infection and contamination. Uh, first of all, listeria is very resilient and very persistent. And once it gets into a food processing plant, it can stay there for decades. And then it doesn't lose virul virulence, it can then cause outbreaks, etc. Uh, listeria is also ubiquitously abundant uh, in the natural environments and suddenly in dairy farms. And you can detect listeria at any random location at uh, any random dairy farm, really. So, um, and finally, listeria is, uh, as a species, is genetically diverse. So we think of listeria monocytogenes as just listeria, but actually it has thousands and thousands of strains, and um, they are dramatically different in their behavior, uh, also called phenotypes. And what that means is that when those uh, strains exist together, they can deal with many bad things that are thrown at them. Uh, so to give you an example, uh, some years ago, the Pasteur Institute in France uh, conducted a pretty uh, huge scale uh, uh, analysis of thousands of listeria strains from different sources. And what they found was uh, surprisingly, well not too surprisingly, um, human isolates uh, tend to cluster together genetically. Uh, food isolates tend to form a different cluster. Uh, human clinical isolates are very virulent, but they are typically poor at forming biofilm and persistence. Uh, and food isolates are the opposite. They're very good at persisting in the environment. They're not as virulent. But if they're all together, then of course they can do many things. Okay, so uh, many foodborne pathogens that we know of, like Salmonella, Campylobacter, are enteric pathogens. So what that means is that they uh, typically colonize the gut. They cause uh, illness symptoms in the gut, inflammation, etc. Listeria actually is not considered an enteric pathogen, and that's because conventionally we think of listeria as just, you know, wanting to get out of the gut. It's not a nice place. Listeria is so much more comfortable uh, at systemic infection, and that's where most of our knowledge uh, is now. Uh, but recent studies have started to shed light on the opposite. Um, that listeria can, in fact, uh, possess in the intestines and very likely um, able to colonize intestines. So, for example, uh, there have been many surveys now in cattle, and we know that uh, fecal shedding of listeria in cattle is very prevalent, uh, both among herds as well as within a herd. Um, and again, the Pasteur Institute just published this story this year where they surveyed uh, stool samples from healthy people um, and people with diarrhea, and 10% uh, of healthy people actually carry listeria asymptomatically, uh, and you know, 20% uh, of, uh, of diarrhea uh, people carry listeria. And finally, uh, in the mouse model of infection, uh, there's a very recent study uh, that shows that you just need to give uh, mice one oral dose of listeria, and those mice will go on and shed listeria for at least a month afterwards. And in that process, uh, listeria goes on to attack uh, certain members of the gut microbiota. Um, and the result is uh, those mice have an altered gut integrity. Okay, so um, one of the long-term goals of my uh, research program um, is to develop uh, uh, effective control strategies to reduce listeria contamination in our uh, food production chain. And, uh, but given that listeria is everywhere um, it, and it can deal with a lot of bad stuff, we thought, well, you know, it wouldn't be very productive if we wouldn't be able to prevent listeria from the source. And so with funding from the dairy hub, we went back to a major source of listeria contamination, and that's subclinical um, cattle. So these are animals that carry listeria but have no symptoms. 
and we asked, um, what are the effects of subclinical infection on animal health and on public health or on our uh, food safety? So to set up the baseline for our uh, study, um, we conducted a, a fecal survey uh, ourselves, and we went to a local um, dairy farm in Wisconsin. It's just about half an hour away. Uh, I can't tell you what, where it is. Um, and we chose 20 healthy cows. Uh, they were lactating at the time. Um, and we uh, collect their feces as well as the silage in front of their stalls. Um, and we looked for listeria in those samples. Um, and remarkably, 90% uh, of those animal, uh, animals uh, shed listeria at least once over our uh, survey period of a, mo of a month. Uh, unsurprisingly, of course, we also found listeria in the silage. But what was also interesting was that uh, towards the end of the survey where listeria was kind of like in and out of the silage, um, the herd as a, as a whole, uh, kept shedding this there anyway. So uh, obviously we need more experimental uh, models to prove this, but what it, sh uh, what it suggests to us is that you just need to get an infection started in the herd and it will keep going uh, even when you withdraw this there from the feed. All right, another way to look at uh, shedding data is to analyze the shedding frequency. Um, and uh, again, what we found really interesting here was that uh, a few animals uh, shed listeria once or twice, and then they never shed again. So what's going on? Uh, uh, and then some other animals just kept on shedding until the last day uh, of our survey. Um, so this is very intriguing to us. We don't know why. Uh, we need more uh, thorough studies to understand this. Um, so we were curious about the listeria population from, from these uh, cows because we know they're diverse. Um, and sure enough, um, they are diverse uh, genetically. Uh, and one animal can carry multiple strains of listeria. And we found uh, all serotypes that are associated with foodborne outbreaks, like uh, 1,2A, 1,2B, 1,2C. Um, we also found uh, quite a few strains that belong to serotype 4B, which is associated with human clinical isolates. So that's kind of bad news, right, uh, because they could go on to infect humans. So then we wanted to assess um, how these strains would respond to uh, antibiotic treatments. Uh, so first we looked at ampicillin, uh, which is the primary uh, antibiotic for treating human listeriosis. And the vast majority of the strains are resistant to ampicillin. Um, Many of them are also resistant to chantamycin, uh, which is used as a secondary drug or in uh, combination with ampicillin. Uh, and a couple uh, are resistant to trimethoprim uh, sofa, um, which is often used for uh, treating cattle. Um, and uh, several isolates are resistant to, uh, to two antibiotics. Uh, one isolate is resistant to all antibiotics. Um, we don't know yet what the clinical implications of this is, but certainly uh, I think I would say that maybe uh, effective treatments in the future should really consider um, the antibiotic uh, resistance profiles of the strains that we're dealing with. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, we thought, well, this, this, uh, these cows had, uh, were shedding listeria, but they looked fine, they were lactating fine, they didn't seem like they were sick, suddenly no circling disease. Should we really worry about these listeria isolates anyway? So um, we looked to assess the uh, infectivity of these listeria isolates. So the first uh, step of listeria infection, of course, is to cross the intestinal barrier. Um, and to assess that, we used a human epithelio, uh, intestinal epithelial cell called cacotil. Um, and we used uh, the prototype strain 10403S in blue as a benchmark because it's very well studied for virulence. And what you may see is that several cow isolates are uh, infected equally well to 10403S. So what it means is that um, if for some reason the gut barrier is uh, compromised, uh, these strains are very able uh, to cross uh, the, the intestinal barrier to go into the bloodstream. Um, 
And then next, uh, after Listeria gets out of the gut, it will go on uh, to invade uh, many cell types and many tissues and organs. Um, and again, we used uh, our benchmark strain 10403S as an indicator. Um, and all of these uh, bovine isolates, uh, e uh, in fact, uh, equally well um, to 10403S or, in many cases, better. And so what that means to us is that they're all capable of causing systemic infection. So taken together, we find this really interesting because these strains are fully virulent. And yet, they weren't making these animals sick. So we, would, uh, so we are very interested in understanding what is keeping these strains in a homeostasis state versus what will trigger them to go on and progress um, to uh, systemic infection at some point. Okay, so uh, some slides ago, I told you that in the uh, infected mouse gut, Listeria uh, can attack uh, certain members of the gut microbiota. So not only is Listeria bad for systemic infection, it might be bad for the gut as well. Um, so nothing was known yet about what Listeria does um, in the cattle or GI tract. Uh, we had an opportunity to do it, so we went for it. Um, we analyzed the microbiota compositions of uh, cows that shed listeria the most in terms of frequency, um, and we compared that to, uh, to, the, to that of uh, cows that didn't shed listeria at all. Um, so I, I need to <laughs> disclose here that we had only two animals that didn't shed, so this data is quite preliminary. But uh, at the first glance, we found uh, no significant difference in alpha diversity of the microbiome. Um, so this is an indicator of the types of microbial species that are there. So in terms of what is there, then everyone looked the same. However, when we looked at the relative abundances of the microbial groups that were there, then we start seeing differences between um, shedding cows and non-shedding cows. Um, so uh, we need to uh, do more uh, experiments to understand what, what, what the impacts uh, this would have on shedding cows and what the reason is for this, but we're encouraged uh, by, by this data uh, to expand our uh, microbiota survey. All right, so to put all these uh, random pieces of data together, um, we found uh, a very high incidence and frequency of listeria shedding from uh, subclinical um, dairy cattle, um, which confirms uh, the notion that dairy animals are uh, a major source of listeria uh, transmission and uh, contamination. Uh, these listeria isolates are mostly um, antibiotic resistant. Uh, they are fully virulent. Uh, we have preliminary data uh, that encourages us to, to understand the impact of uh, listeria, uh, subclinical and asymptomatic listeria infection um, on uh, cattle uh, and uh, the host gut health. So uh, we're very encouraged to, to uh, learn more about uh, what subclinical listeriosis might do to animals uh, in terms of long-term health and reproduction and uh, physiology. Um, and I just want to drive home uh, the message that um, in order to uh, ensure the, the safety of our food supply, uh, we need to go back to the source and enrich uh, animal health. Um, and with that, I do have uh, to thank a lot of people. Uh, the project was initiated by Justin uh, Chow, a master's student in the lab. Then he fled. Well, he graduated. Um, and then our, <laughs> our postdoc, uh, Aaron Gall, who's here today, um, took over and did all of the phenotypic and genetic analyses of Listeria. And he has a postdoc today, so uh, please come talk with him. Um, uh, I uh, was fortunate to work with some wonderful large animal uh, veterinarians. Uh, Keith Paulson uh, educated me all about uh, cattle health and reproduction. 
Um, yet soon in the bacteriology taught us about uh, uh, next-gen sequencing. Uh, and of course, thank you so much uh, to, to support uh, from the Dairy Hub. Without your support, this work would never have happened. Uh, and if you're interested, please contact me at this email address. Thank you. Thanks, Tuan. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our final speaker for this uh, track this morning, or speakers. Uh, John Lucy is the director of the Center for Dairy Research. Uh, John has a PhD in food science and 20 years of experience uh, doing research in Ireland, the Netherlands, New Zealand, and, and thankfully here in Wisconsin. And as CDR director, John provides leadership to that uh, center and their staff in helping CDR carry out its mission, and he's also a professor in food science and does research on functionality of dairy foods and has published uh, 130 plus articles and, and uh, another 20 book chapters. Uh, Tom Gurin will share the stage as well, and Tom has also spent uh, more than two decades in research and development at Cary and then uh, in working with manufacturers in different applications in countries uh, across the globe. Uh, he manages the research program at CDR and, and works with staff on building programs to become more aligned with the demands of the food industry. Uh, Tom's a, a native of Ireland and has a PhD in biochemistry from the National University of Ireland in Galway. So welcome to our, our next speakers. Looks like John's going to start us off. Thank you, Kent. Uh, it's very nice to be able to present this morning. Actually, the first time I came and gave a talk in Wisconsin was when I was came, coming from Ireland, finishing after my PhD, talking about making cheese from grass-based milk. So I was very interested in Randy's talk this morning. A little bit, uh, I want to set the stage. You know, the, the topic we were asked to talk about today is talk a little bit about the CDR. And um, yesterday we did our virtual tour for those of you who could attend it. And um, some of you got a chance to walk through. And this weekend, we'll actually open up two floors of the new CDR edition, so it's a very exciting time for us. So it's a kind of an appropriate time to talk a little bit about what the CDR is and how we can collaborate together as we go forward with these exciting times with new facilities and other capabilities. The, C the CDR has been around since the mid-1980s and has about 40-plus staff. And in fact, you'll hear from Tom, my colleague Sam's program later, because of... Um, separate federal USDA money, we've added some additional staff in the last couple of years, primarily to help us with um, entrepreneurial and industry impact type of activities. Most of our funding at the, the center comes from dairy farmers through the checkup programs. About 70% of our money comes directly from farmers through either the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board, which is now called Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin, or the national body, the DMI or the National Dairy Council. They put it in really to put boots on the ground, people and staff and programs in there to support the industry and do kind of extension work, but also some applied research and training kind of works as well. Uh, we work with, um, here in the state, we work with over 100 dairy companies, our suppliers. And I think if you uh, add in associations and other groups we work with, we probably work with over 300 companies a year on a variety of activities, either training, product development, process, or other kind of development. Um, so we're kind of a go-to group for people to come and work with us from industry and other groups to get assistance on all kinds of things, random kind of things I can tell you sometimes too. The purpose of the CDR has slightly broadened, I think, because Wisconsin as a, as a, a state and dairy industry has broadened uh, over the last 30 years. This, this title would have said um, Wisconsin dairy industry probably if you went back to 1986. But if you look at what's happened here in the state, we have significant um, investment in the state by companies like Saputo, Agripor, and others that have come in from Canada into the U.S. and really built and modernized many of our cheese facilities. So we look at it as North America uh, as a broader thing. And also we're getting national dairy checkoff funding as well to support uh, companies outside of the state as well. Our key, our key roles are, are generating new knowledge. Obviously, we're here at a university, a world-class university such as UW-Madison, but also transferring those insights, much like what our traditional extension does as well, is actually getting that information out. So we do a lot of training, workshops, plant visits, 
and a lot of connections with industry to try and get that information out. Um, as I always say, if you publish something, which is great, I'm a professor, we publish, we have students, but if we can't get that information out, it really doesn't do the impact that we hoped it would do as we did all that work on it. There are about six different buckets of activities that go on within the center. I won't spend much time talking about all of them, but all of them are important program areas that we do. Uh, training and education uh, is a critical one for us. And, and training and education, I break it into two different buckets. One is the, the outward facing to the industry. And we brought on pro somewhere in the region of about 30 different training workshops every year for industry. Um, we just had one this week and ongoing actually today. And we're back to our in-person short courses, thankfully, after uh, a hiatus of, of just over a year. Uh, and, and industry folks will come to Babcock Hall, come to our short course, uh, make cheese, sample cheese, learn about uh, processing, ice cream, milk, cheese, etc., and go back. Here in the state of Wisconsin, um, we have some of the best cheese makers and, and processors in, in the world. But they, we also have requirements about licensing and requirements that these uh, workers have to achieve. So they really are engaged in coming back and getting further qualifications and training. We're also involved in, in, in graduate students, and I'll, I'll, I'll focus on that a little bit later on. And prior to COVID and campus lockdowns and all the other things we've lived through in the last year or so, we employed about 30 plus undergrad students within the center as well, doing a variety of work experiences and also assisting us in our program areas. We do a lot of applied research, and I'll touch on that in a second. But our facilities, as you saw yesterday, our modern uh, our facilities, are really also used by the industry to do a lot of product development, process development, whether it's specialty cheese or new yogurts or new cheeses. That's really a place that they do not have uh, at their own plants. They're production facilities. They're not pile of plants and trials, and that's what we serve as a bridge. Our staff have a lot of a technical experience, so they do a lot of troubleshooting, phone calls, visits, plant visits, analysis, helping people out as well. We created the Master Cheesemaker Program, which is the only program of its kind here in the U.S., and this is an ad advanced qualification for cheesemakers here only in the state. They have to be 10 years a licensed Wisconsin cheesemaker before they can apply. There's a board that has the cheesemakers themselves involved in it, as well as people from the university, and we really are there to try and elevate their academic side of it, not replace their skills and their artists and knowledge, but really to give them more technical knowledge by having them enroll in courses and they go to a curriculum here on the campus. Tom is going to focus more on the entrepreneurial side of it. It's a big focus area for us for the last 10 plus years. We've always been more on the technical training, applied research side of it, but we've added that additional spoke in, in as I say, in recent years. So getting back to the topic about how do we work with uh, uh, groups, researchers, and stuff on campus, one of, the, one of the more practical ways that we work with people on campus is that um, starting as a Wisconsin center and later as a National Dairy Foods Research Center is we're an umbrella organization here on campus to, to channel through this checkoff dollars that come from these two organizations. What that means in practice is that we have um, master agreements or contracts in place with both of those organizations that make it easy for campus researchers then to have a project funded under those programs. Before that, every single project that, that a person wanted to do here had to be separately negotiated, all the contractual agreement with these funders. Um, that isn't necessary anymore. All of these are done as simple amendments to the master agreements. And in fact, we end up uh, doing um, 10 plus projects a year. Not all of them are done at CDR, they're done at FRI, they're done in nutritional sciences or in engineering under this banner or under this program uh, from, from the national body. We then, uh, our, our role in it is basically to help administer that locally for these organizations, make sure the reports get in, make sure the budgets are done, et cetera. We do the local management from it and as center director we have um, monthly meetings, annual meetings, et cetera, to make sure these processes work. And we have about six other national centers. We are by far and away the largest, but there are other centers across the U.S. as well. On the research side, which is obviously a way that we can interact and do interact with campus uh, uh, faculty and students, is we have a research team here, and I, I, I see it over here, Mark Johnson and Rani are both distinguished scientists. 
Both of them are, are very high caliber uh, scientists. Mark has been here actually 41 years uh, at CDR. He predates the CDR. He's the only staff member we have still here who predates the foundation of the CDR, and he still enjoys what he does and comes in every day. Um, they are the ones uh, within the CDR out of our 40 plus um, staff uh, that actually are probably most involved in research. There are others that are involved but that's not their primary function. These, these staff, are their primary function is to do research. And they're involved in graduate student research, publishing, presenting, like other scientists and stuff uh, around our campus. In terms of some of this research activity, some of the ways uh, that we work and interact with faculty around here, I just want to give some examples how we've done it in the past. We are PIs and co-PIs, our reviewers on many people's grants. Um, I see some people here that we've been reviewers on and assisted or sometimes even collaborators on. And that goes for food science department, collaborations with the bioenergy to look at biofermentations of dairy wastes. Uh, we, we, we reach out to try and find people who have a shared interest with us and, and where we can get funding, just like everything else. The CDR doesn't, doesn't actually fund any projects itself. We're a pass-through from these other bodies to uh, administer the grants that they give. We do a lot of mentoring. Uh, right now, we have about uh, P CDR staff, our PI or co-PI in 12 graduate student projects and there's about another three or four projects that are ongoing on campus where we may be collaborating with. We won't be the PI, but we might be assisting with some trials, work, analysis, testing, et cetera, or, or, or on their um, graduate student committee. We also have extensive labs and testing and pilot plants, and over the years, our, our labs and pilot plants have been used to make the cheese for graduate students, to make the powders, to make the yogurts, to do the testing, and so on. So I think that's an important resource to help people because not everybody is going to have all the resources to be able to do some of these tests. We also have provided startup for dairy foods faculty. Both Scott and myself were lucky to get funding from the CDR when we were starting out. That has continued to for dairy foods faculty. We actually don't have a lot of um, additional funds for these things, but the CDR has been creative before my time, set up uh, an industry consortia, much, much like FRI, and through that those funds are much less restricted to grant funds, and they're the ones that usually end up helping faculty and startups. And then also there's a lot of practical things, and in recent years that's become more important. Industry connections. We were involved with the bioenergy guys and Victor in food science this year in kind of putting together a group here on campus to go after um, one of those new WARF initiatives for promoting collaborations with industry. We were able to recruit about seven industry support letters, uh, and we brought the team together. We didn't actually have that experience ourselves. We are not biofermentation experts within the CDR, but we did know who could do that on campus and partnered with industry, and they did get funded for that major project and started ourselves. It's part of our priorities to show that we can um, address this kind of issue within our, within our state. Another activity we do, and we host every year, uh, and we're going back to an in-person activity this year again, is we host here, usually on the west side of town at a hotel, um, a research forum for industry. Uh, industry typically are coming from dairy industry. They're technical folks, R&D folks, practical folks. Um, could be over 100 of those will come and attend for an all-day session. And then we invite graduate students and faculty that are working on some aspects of dairy foods to this event every year. And the idea is to really showcase the breadth of dairy foods part. This, the Dairy Innovation Hub is broader than dairy foods, obviously. We focus on the dairy foods part of it and, and use that occasion to let them give an update on what's happening here on campus, whether it's on the safety quality, processing cheese, or biofermentation, or other kind of topics. Um, we also use it as a showcase for new faculty to come along, and this year we'll be doing two of those as well for new faculty and showcasing them so their programs get a chance to be heard by funders and also by industry as well. It's a great recruiting tool for the students, I can tell you, too, because they, we ask them to do a one-page sheet about who they are, what their experience is, and when they're graduating. That's given to all the industry attendees as well. We've also run technology showcases for campus innovation uh, and highlighting new innovations and entrepreneurs, and we've done that, and we'll probably get back to that again now that COVID is starting to slowly uh, come back down again in terms of uh, restrictions. 
Yesterday, we spent a lot of time with our virtual tour and uh, the actual tour. The new CDR facility, we're excited to, to have, and I think it's going to be a great asset as we go forward for both research and other kind of activities. Um, has a lot of pilot facilities. Now, to and myself are talking this week about the specialty cheese rooms are going to open up soon. So we'll be able to work on various types of facilities that we didn't have the capability before, and it opens up all kinds of interesting capabilities. Uh, two of the floors of the three floors are dedicated to research pilot plants, but it is fully inspected space, so the products can be tasted and consumer testing can be done. Um, it's not just research. We wanted to go to that extra level. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to ask my colleague uh, Tom to come up and kind of move on to a little bit about a, a com completely different type of program. So thank you. Welcome to your second Irish accent for the day. I get this right. Oh, wrong way. So I'm here to talk about the what we call the Dairy Business Innovation Alliance, um, and this is actually a partnership between uh, ourselves, the Center for Dairy Research, and the Wisconsin Cheesemakers Association. Uh, came about in 2018 out of the uh, Farm Bill. Um, we actually cover a five-state region, as you can see down here between. South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and uh, Illinois. Uh, and what our function is, or actually maybe I'll just go back to the origin side here fairly quickly. So like I said, came out of the 2018 Farm Bill, really looking at a way to create uh, innovation uh, down to, let's say, the farmer or small processor level, uh, supporting dairy businesses through production, marketing, distribution of dairy products. Um, and there was a specific uh, concentration on diversification, uh, promoting uh, business and products through marketing initiatives, et cetera, and basically encouraging the use of regional milk production. So when it came out in 2018, a number of uh, groups here together in Wisconsin uh, came together to figure out the best way for us to avail of this grant that came out. Um, and it was decided in the end ourselves and Wisconsin cheesemakers were probably the most efficient way to do this. Uh, the award itself, uh, the first year we, we came out back in 2019, I think there was $460,000 came out, and I'll explain how all that's uh, allocated later on. Last year, we, we were awarded uh, $6.13 million, which again is great news for the industry. And then recently, the third award came out, and we were also funded another $6.13 million. In this 2018 Farm Bill as well, there are two other centers that were founded at the same time, one in Vermont uh, and one out of Tennessee. And recently they announced a fourth one out of California in Fresno State. So what programs do we have? Well, the um, Farm Bill itself demands that we hand out at least 50% of the funding that we've received as grants. And then the rest goes towards uh, direct technical assistance. And the rest of my presentation here will be around that kind of area. So our grant programs we've divided into two, uh, two types. The first one, which we're calling the business builder, really is aimed at the smaller farmers, smaller processors, and looking to kind of push uh, their ideas and their innovation, et cetera, into products they want to develop or marketing type programs. So really aimed at a lot of those kind of smaller processors and dairy farmers. A more recent grant program that we launched, and I'll show you some details on that in a second, we're calling the industry impact, where we're looking for those bigger ideas, tackling maybe a, a more... Uh, larger problem for the industry and one that can actually benefit the wider industry. And we, I'll show you some of the results of, of that that we have so far. The technical assistance is a similar type of an approach. How do we help as many small guys as possible, but at the same time, maybe pulling milk into other different programs. So we're talking about access to resources, which is actually quite a lot of what we're doing as well. Uh, and then looking at some ways of opening up product development opportunities. If I look at our grant programs, uh, where we have been so far in fall of uh, 2020, we did our first program. We awarded 230,000, which is exactly half of what we got. Uh, and we handed out 13 grants of up to uh, $20,000 uh, to various farmers across the five state region. I can tell you at the time, and I'll refer to it again, we had 77 applications at that time. Uh, so we think we're reaching the right uh, audience, and I'll show you some details I think that we have on that as well. 
Then in the spring, uh, where we got the larger award, we actually handed out uh, 25 grants of up to $50,000. So again, about $1.2 million heading out as well into the five state region. Evenly spread, I'd say, if you look at the number of applicants by state out to, um, uh, to each of the states, so spread across the five. We recently, literally just uh, the last couple of weeks, we announced the results of our industry impact grant. I'll show you who the winners of that were here recently. That was our first time stepping into that area. We were kind of wondering how it would go, but we think it's uh, been pretty successful. And now we're into, uh, I'd say, a fairly regular schedule of these grant programs. So there's another one coming maybe in the winter or early spring uh, in 2022. So this is kind of the, the way we're arranged with our grant programs. We are ca gathering a lot of information because we want to be able to report back to the USDA in terms of the efficiency of how this program is going. Uh, and this is just a quick graph to show you that we know we're reaching in terms of number of employees, et cetera. We are reaching the, the target audience of the initiative itself. When I talked about the industry impact grants, uh, here are the four that were awarded. Very briefly, I'll go through them. Cedar Grove uh, came up with a, 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 a basic a process that they have for trading waste, wastewater, et cetera, converting into fertilizer. That's a marketable type product. They want to do a scale-up version of that, and they will share all that with industry as well, so very applicable to the smaller, medium-sized processors. Uh, specialty Cheese is actually a consortium of a group of smaller companies who have come up with a model for an export program. Uh, they were looking for some funding to put that model into place, and they're also going to be presenting their findings and results to the wider industry as it's uh, very repeatable, or you could replicate that to other groups. Mint Specialties Global uh, in Minnesota are looking at um, identifying some of the nutritional uh, benefits of D-lactose permeate in, in feed, obviously looking to see some ways of claiming better value for that kind of a product. And in Good Sport Nutrition, some of you might be familiar with them, uh, we're funding some of their work attending what we'd like to call kind of influencer type trade shows, where this is really the first dairy-based ingredient to break into the sports market. They have the clinical research, et cetera, and we feel by supporting them in this particular run, it'll open the door for other dairy products into a very lucrative uh, sports beverage market. When I look at the um, technical assistance programs, we talk about access. That's access to, as John said, some staff on site at the CDR so they can gain into access into our uh, equipment, et cetera. One of our other collaborators is Midwest Dairy, and they obviously have a network of uh, <coughs> excuse me, resources as well. We are providing funds to travel to see some of our awardees, make sure they're up and running, see what, uh, any other w which ways we can help. Uh, and then very importantly, our e-library, which uh, I'll refer to back again, is a, an online resource for many of the wide variety of resources that farmers, as we've seen, or, or dairy processors coming into the center. Some of the other um, resources or capabilities that they would need to actually get their business up and running. There are two programs here. We commissioned um, two pieces of market intelligence to look at um, export opportunities for U.S. cheese into the Asian and Middle East market. That work is just done. We had our very first kind of review of that with certain members here from Wisconsin. Our, our colleagues in dairy farmers of Wisconsin and DACAP were involved in that. We have some funding to do sensory analysis of those type of cheeses, compare them to American products, and we have some funding as well for prototype development. So there will be a more public uh, presentation of that information coming up soon, uh, and obviously getting a lot more feedback into what we can do there in the next steps. And in a similar fashion, we did uh, a national uh, review, um, survey of go to cheap cheese, looking to see what do we need to do to maybe uh, displace imports of goat and sheep cheese. So we did a similar deal there. That work is done as well. Uh, and there'll be some follow-up meetings with industry uh, and uh, to review the next steps again on sensory and what type of product development would be required here. We did initially, so let me, let me go back very quickly one second. When we did our first round of grants, I said we got 77 applications, et cetera. Uh, it was an interesting, long, drawn-out type process. And soon after that, we launched a series of webinars. This is our first, uh, the one in orange here, which we call the Let's Get Started. 
Because as I said, here at the center, when we have entrepreneurs coming to us, they have a great technical idea, but quite often didn't understand how do I do, uh, get set up as a business, what's regulatory mean, uh, how do I implement food safety, all, this kind of, uh, all these kind of capabilities that you would need to understand. So we put together a very simple, I'd say, uh, series of webinars aimed at showing people what both the regional and federal resources are in each of these areas. And all of this is on our website, including all the various re um, resources that go along with this. This also reminds me, just to mention, that we have a wide variety of collaborators, uh, not just here within the state, uh, our own Department of Ag, uh, our Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin, the university itself, small business development centers, all of them came together to help us put all of these together. Uh, and the reason why I mentioned it in relation to the first round of grants is when we did our second round of grants, we actually required people to go and take a look at the, f the webinars. And the quality of applications in that second round was significantly improved in terms of not just the technical aspect, but also the commercial aspect. People had business plans put in. They had thought about their next steps. They had thought about risks. So it was a, a big improvement. <coughs> Excuse me. We then did a second round of uh, webinars. Actually, we've seven done. The next one's next week. And they're very quick, these webinars, less than an hour. And they're all from people who have actually done these kind of things. But this second round was about, well, OK, I am set up in business. How do I keep it going? How do I grow? Uh, what do I need to look out for? I'll only do a quick call out of a couple. Um, the risk management one, we had um, a gentleman, Ben Ducharme, from M3 Insurance give a presentation. And it really turned out to be what I can only describe as maybe a HACCP plan for your business. A really good idea of showing the kind of uh, issues you need to keep an eye out for, what you can control, what you can't control, and how you might control things. And then the other one I would call out is the last one we did, which was e-commerce. We had Andy Hatch from Uplands Cheese, who gave an excellent presentation on why you would do e-commerce, why you would avoid it, the pitfalls, etc. And again, very popular. We've had over 750 views of this particular series. We've had about 230 views of the second one already. And the more we advertise it, we see people availing of it. And we see that cropping up in the uh, grant applications that we receive. So how to engage with us? Right now, the DBIA is hosted on the CDR website, but you can actually access it through our own website or through the Wisconsin Cheesemakers Association. If you want to reach out to any of us, I'd say one of the five people up here would probably be the more direct uh, contacts to reach out to. Uh, Vic Rassman, myself, Emily, who's our uh, DBIA coordinator, and then from Wisconsin Cheesemakers, Grace Atherton and uh, Rebecca Sweeney would be good contacts as well. So having said all of that, a big thank you to AMS USDA for making these funds available, uh, and to all our collaborators, including some of you here in the room, there's quite a lot of uh, support we've had in pulling all this together. Uh, a lot more to come. Uh, keep an eye out. And if anybody wants, has any questions, we're available. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, uh, John and Tom. Um, let's see, so now uh, let's enter into the question phase of today's symposium. Uh, certainly thanks to all of our speakers. I guess logistically, if you do have a question, um, please come to the mic first. And we're working to capture all the content here as such. So um, please uh, come to the mic and then uh, maybe call out who you're directing your question to. And maybe if uh, that speaker could come to this mic here again, so we're, for the, we can capture your response. Okay. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Yeah. Make sure the mic is functioning there. Yeah, good morning. My, my question is to the ice cream professor from Platteville. Um, you mentioned one of the ingredients uh, of the ice cream was gelatin. In your opinion, what are the pros and cons of a plant-based gelatin over animal-based gelatin? You are correct. We, we didn't actually include gelatin in our recipes, but I can see where you're coming from. I know gelatin, gelatin raises concerns for certain communities, especially if they're animal products, whether it's kosher, halal, or just vegan in general. I would imagine as long as the gel gelatin can um, provide the stabilizing effect that it's intended to have, then plant-based gelatin would be 
very good uh, uh, option for it. Uh, do you, you don't see any difference, for example, in cheese. If animal rennet is being used, it preserves the cheese longer uh, as opposed to the uh, plant-based rennet. Do you see any difference in the gelatin for the ice cream? Is there a difference in the product itself? Oh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to address that point yet. I, I think that's some research we'll be taking up down the road. Um, but yeah, currently we hadn't been able to assess the stability of the ice cream in terms of its gel gelatin content. Okay. But thank you for the question. You're welcome. Denise Ney, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Jim, I want to stick on the ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, Tom. Uh, um, so in my view, chocolate or vanilla ice cream from Babcock Hall is perfection. <laughs> it's my view. Uh -huh. um, however, there seems to be a new trend in ice cream, wherever you look, that you've got to add something to it. Yes. We've got nuts. That's been a long time. We've got peppermint chips. We've got peanut butter and the chocolate and, <laughs> and many other cookies and cream, et cetera. This seems to be the way forward for ice cream. Uh -huh. So I wonder if you see that your methodology could be adapted for these ice cream add-ons to evaluate the important characteristics that you mentioned. Yes, that's, that's a very good question. As a fan of mint chocolate chip myself, I can say that I'm interested in pursuing at least that avenue of the research. And I think um, butter pecan is also kind of a favorite. So those added components, the solid pecans, the solid chocolate chips, and all of those things are amenable to our method. And uh, one of the measurements that we do, the um, mastication profile, it literally denotes some um, chewing activities, is able to capture some of those hard materials. Uh, there's like a brittle, brittleness function in it. As for caramel and all of that, it does end up complicating the rheological properties of it. And we kind of think that the, um, there was a figure of um, the, the spring damper systems, a bunch of zigzag lines and then some like cups and holders. Um, those, I believe, will be able to be broadened and adapted to more complex mixtures rather than just that kind of base homogeneous mixtures that we started with. So I hope to find out. Thank you. Good to know. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, Cara, are there any online questions yet? Okay. So we'll hold tight uh, invite the next, um, uh, anyone wish to pose the next question, please I invite you to the mic. So quick introduction, uh, name your speaker and then question, go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, Brad Bowling from the Department of Food Science. I have a question for John, John and Tom about the um, capabilities of the new CDR, especially around powders. So something that we've been interested in are is yogurt, you heard from our talk er earlier, and kind of the production of high value powders. We've seen yo yogurt powder going into confections and, and other things like that. Is, is that, you know, I, I know there's so many different types of dairy powders, but, and, and there's some interesting equipment in, in there. Could you just say a, a little bit about what that capability is? Uh, th thanks, Brad. Um, yes, so um, I don't know if you saw the video yesterday, but we have installed and started commissioning a brand new spray dryer. And so there's actually two spray dryers in the new CDR edition. One was the traditional one that we had in Babcock, um, which has been moved up there. It's a single stage dryer. It can do a lot of basic um, products, but the new dryer is about twice as large and it is a three stage dryer. So it allows you to do drying in the main dryer tower and then at the bottom of the dryer is more drying and then there's an external bed. So I think it will give us a lot of capabilities at the small scale. So still, this is still what I would say large pilot scale but still enough to get powders to do trials or to do, do tests. Um, it will give us a lot of capabilities. I actually think we can probably do most type of uh, dairy products we can probably do. There are some unusual dairy products that are hard to dry anyway, you know, some lactose-rich ones, but most of the interesting kind of products we can dry. 
and that should be commissioned within the next couple of weeks and ready to go. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Mark Levenstein from the UW Platteville Biology Department. I have a question for Dr. Hasegawa. Uh, I was curious uh, if you have any uh, insider speculation about the striking differences uh, you saw between male and female mouse responses um, and then sort of the similarities within the plasma samples. Thank you for your question. Um, there are a lot of differences between the sexes. So, and we actually don't have exact reason, like, you know, exact answer um, uh, for the, the difference that we saw in our specific project. But I think one of the possibility is a sex hormone. So females tended to be more protective against the, the obesity um, symptoms. That is partly because of the estrogen that is involved in a lot of pathways, like um, energy metabolism, like TCA, uh, TCA cycles. Um, and some of the um, enzymes involved in that metabolism um, is known to be regulated by estrogen, for example. So um, it seems like those sex hormones are really involved in the, the changes in, uh, or difference in the metabolism. So that could be a, like one of the reasons, but there may be many more <laughs> reasons. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. No, <laughs> So, okay, uh, Grace Lewis from UW River Falls, one of the new DIH faculty. So my question, and hopefully it's gonna make sense, is that when you looked at the microbiota, you saw that the, so the control lean mice, as well as the yogurt consuming lean mice, as well as the obese control mice, all the same kind of profile, or not significantly different microbiota profile, and then the ones that consumed yogurt were the only ones that varied. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what microbes were present that were different, and what do you think they were contributing because it seems like that change is what kind of caused their, their different reactions altogether. Right. Thank you for your question. Um, so one of the um, microbes, a family of microbes that um, appear to be significantly different in the obese yogurt supplemented group is a lactinospirases. So that's uh, involved, the abundance of it is involved in the, um, the risk for diabetes. So that seems to be kind of related to what we saw in the um, insulin resistance level. But one of the limitations of our study is that we didn't uh, look at the sequel content before we start the, the food change. So it's kind of difficult to see what specific microbes, group of microbes were changed from the you know, original. But um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, Denise May again. So I really enjoyed your talk and I think it really has relevance to what we call personalized nutrition, because the tip of the iceberg for personalized nutrition is male versus female differences, right. and then it goes on from, from there. Um, but I have a question about your work with the aryl hydrocarbon receptor and tryptophan metabolites. So tryptophan is the precursor for the neurotransmitter serotonin. Mm -hmm. Most of the serotonin in the circulation is in the, in the body, in the circulation doesn't come from the brain, it comes from the gut, okay? So I wonder if you have considered serotonin differences, males versus female mice, obese versus lean, as a possible factor which could be influencing your ability to interact with the aryl hydrocarbon receptor and thus downstream inflammation. Interesting. Thank you for your question. Um, i actually not aware of how serotonin specifically affects okay. the gut microbe, you know, the, the intestinal barrier. So I'm interested in looking that, uh, into that. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm not aware of how exactly okay. that would affect. Right. The gut microbiota will uh -huh. feed back to uh -huh. affect how much tryptophan goes into serotonin metabolism. We've uh -huh. looked into this a bit with our PKU subjects. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. I understand so that. You might just want to look, look a little bit into serotonin mm -hmm. levels in, yeah, in your mind. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for your You're suggestion. Welcome. All right, uh, maybe I'll ask a question to 
Dr. Hoon, did, what can you tell us about um, a view of, 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 of listeria as it presents itself in, in processing plants? Uh, is there anything, do you have any view of what that might, might look like? Uh, so you, you, you're able to describe uh, listeria and different strains and so forth in, in cow feces and so forth. Any, is there any indication or any studies that, that have a similar view but how listeria has infested actual processing facilities. Thanks for your question, Scott. Um, I, don't, I don't know what specifically uh, you are interested about listeria in food processing plants. So I guess I'm, I'm just going to address uh, broadly that there have certainly been um, ecological surveys of what sort of listeria populations there are in different uh, food processing plants and you know what sort of equip what, what sort of strains would be associated with certain locations um, and as you can imagine uh, there is, is dynamic. Um, I, I don't think there have been a lot of studies trying to connect um, listeria strains coming from uh, you know, dairy uh, agricultural production to food production to humans, like the whole process. So I think that's, that's an opportunity for us to understand um, there. Uh, but suddenly, once listeria is deposited um, on uh, food processing equipment or food processing plants, um, it sticks around a while. Um, and there are many reasons for that, um, persistence, biofilm, but it does stick around for decades even. And, and there have been studies um, showing uh, by, uh, for example, by Dr. Martin uh, Wheatman's uh, lab at Cornell, uh, he, and he showed that um, there are, there are foodborne outbreaks that are caused by listeria that, that was deposited at a food processing, uh, processing plant like, I don't know, 30 years ago. So that's quite remarkable. Uh, Bethany Dato-Sun from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I have a question regarding your gut microbiota analysis. So obviously there's inherent differences between the dairy cow as a ruminant and humans as non-ruminants. Do you have any plans to be doing a comparison analysis in terms of how microbial populations shift? And then also, just as a philosophical question, um, you mentioned at the end that it, there's a negative effect on the microbial shift in the dairy cow. What, in your opinion, defines negative versus just altered? Because I've seen so many gut microbiota studies, especially in dairy, like if you sneeze at them, you know, they change. So what, what characterizes a negative shift in your mind? Uh, so yes, I, uh, were, me and my lab were very interested in understanding more about the, the impacts of, of listeria on uh, cattle gut microbiota um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, you know what, maybe listeria is bad for cattle health after all, and maybe, uh, and uh, just from you know, my observation, adult cattle tend to be quite tolerant to listeria compared to adult humans. So if we understand how cattle uh, are resistant to listeria infection in general, maybe we can develop better uh, treatment strategies or uh, prophylactic strategies for humans. Um, so in order to do that though, I, we need to develop uh, an experimental infection uh, model because our survey uh, was for um, naturally shedding cows and you can imagine there are many factors uh, that confound the survey. Um, and then for your second question, what, what uh, yeah, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I, I don't think that I was, I was too precise about uh, describing the change as being negative. Uh, I think it might just be a change. But what I view as a negative change is when um, certain uh, microbial species that are known to be beneficial um, to, for example, short chain asset production, uh, uh, etc. When those uh, microbial groups are reduced in, in relative abundances, and I would think of those as um, as, a, as a negative impact. Uh, but that said, because we 
because uh, cattle GI tract microbiota is best studied in the rumen and not in the uh, lower uh, gastrointestinal tract. Uh, obviously, we don't really know that just yet. Um, but actually, so, so that, uh, so the changes in microbiota, I think, comes in two flavors, right? So one is, um, can we look at a certain microbiome uh, and predict how um, susceptible or resistant that animal or individual will be to listed infection? Um, and, and two is, uh, you know, uh, following a period of sustained uh, listed infection, um, what uh, changes in uh, microbiome can we expect? Um, and yeah, we would very much like to find out, and I think that a prerequisite to really understand that is to have an infection model. Thanks. So, Kara, is there any, any uh, let's thank, thank you, Tuan. Um, probably wrap it up now, right, Kara? All right. Well, let's give a final round of applause for our speakers today. And certainly invite you to continue discussions on either gelatin or listeria or otherwise. Uh, speaking, though, of, of, uh, of serotonin and, and hopefully not of listeria, we do have lunch downstairs back in uh, Varsity. Uh, Varsity 3, so uh, I invite you to join us there and thank you so much for attending this, uh, this session. Thank you.